Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dr. Barbara Beach, co-founder and medical director, and Peter Farber, Sacrini, CEO of George Mark Children's House. Barbara Beach has been a pediatric oncologist at Children's Hospital and Research Center in Oakland for more than 30 years. She co-founded George Mark Children's House in 2004. Peter has more than 20 years experience as a healthcare industry administrator and was appointed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to deliver health care in the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. George Mark Children's House provides palliative care as the first freestanding residential pediatric care facility in the United States. George Mark's unique care is offered regardless of a family's ability to pay. Peter and Barbara have generously agreed to share some of their experiences, insights, and I would like to thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. So as a founder of this facility, you were there from the pre-existence of George Mark to today. Talk about the impetus for your move to co-found this facility. What was the need that you saw that was not being afforded in a hospital environment? As a pediatric oncologist, I had worked with families who had the possibility, if not the probability, of seeing their child die in childhood. And um, I think you can't do the work of pediatric oncology without realizing that the loss of a child is a life-altering experience, obviously, for any family. And the way in which that happens will impact that family for many, many years to come. And when I say family, I mean not only the parents, but also the siblings and the extended family, grandparents, childhood, you know, classmates, etc. So it became clear to me pretty early on in my career that the hospital was not always the best place for a child to die. It wasn't always the most family friendly place for a child to die. And frankly, many of the children, when they knew that they were going to be dying, did not want to die in the hospital. Many of them would ask to be able to go home and be able to die at home. So you began to take the emphasis off of just the technical aspects of providing um, care and, and redress um, for the, the physical condition. And you now expanded the definition of what care meant. My first efforts were actually directed toward um, supporting families who wanted to take their child home, who said spending more time in the hospital is not a good way for us to spend our limited amount of time we want our child to be at home. And so I would make a lot of home visits. I would try to provide support for those families at home when they had made that choice. And this was not necessarily supported at the, at the time. That's correct. Early there really time. weren't resources for that. And so in the mid 80s, um, I don't remember the exact year, the early to mid 80s, I was involved with um, Judith Dunlop, who at the time was a, a nurse. She's gone on to, to do other things as well. But she was a nurse who was also very interested in palliative care for children. And the term, if I could digress for just a minute, the term palliative care really, people tend to, first they either don't know what it means or they equate it with end of life care. And in fact, um, it is very much more than end of life care. End of life care is simply the final phase of a, an ongoing medical condition. So um, palliative care is not limited to end of life care. In fact, end of life care is a small, actually, amount of the palliative care that we do at George Mark Children's House. Palliative care ideally really begins at the time of a diagnosis of, of a severe lifespan limiting, potentially terminal diagnosis. But in childhood, many of these children live for years, if not decades, with their diagnosis. So everyone knows what, what the diagnosis portends, but the child has a lot of living to do before that happens. So um, Judith and I set up a program called Hospice for Young People. We were supported by one of the home nursing um, agencies in, in the East Bay. You were at that point testing this idea of providing a balance of care and caring uh, within a different environment. And, and allowing these children to really live their lives fully in spite of their diagnosis. Play with their friends, and be Exactly, home sleep and... in their own bed, be with their pets. Their yeah. pets are very important to them. And actually freeing parents from the necessity of going back and forth to the hospital every day 
they, they, they were not, at least at that time, allowed to bring other children into the hospital setting. So these children who were hospitalized would go long periods of time without seeing their siblings. The parents were torn between spending time with the sick child in the hospital and the well children at home, yes. trying to keep their home together, oftentimes trying to hold a job. It was, it was really fraught with difficulty. And the parents really, m many of them did not see that they had any other option for how to deal with this tragic situation involving one of their children. So Peter, while, while Barbara was, was exploring these ideas and creating out of these ideas and, and, and this, this uh, passion, a, a series of programs, what, what, were you, what was your career trajectory? Well, I've been a hospital administrator by training. So I've basically been CEO of hospitals, mostly in Southern California. Although when I got married a second time, came up here in Northern California about 14 years ago, was involved in a local hospital like Highland Hospital. But my training has been in public health. So I've been always interested in terms of how can we do something differently? How can we do it better? And being in the medical field, but getting away from this, saying what is the quality of life and what can we do for people besides just the medical care? and the cost of that care because it became very evident that it's very costly. So we're looking always for an alternative as a public health person. For you, it's a broader definition as well of, of what is. health care is about. It is, and be having experience both in for-profit sector, administering hospitals as well as non-for-profits, including UCLA and Kaiser, I get a breadth of available knowledge of what's going on in alternatives that we can look at. And I think that's what, in a sense, helped me at one time being appointed as, as like I said, the visit Governor Schwarzenegger to be head of the prison system. And that's again, it's another perspective looking at how you deliver healthcare in a different environment. So I've been always involved sort of a, as, as a public health kind of person involved with different alternatives. How did you both meet? Well, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. <laughs> Actually, um, George and Mark about a couple of years ago uh, had some information sent out to news wires that they may be closing because of financial needs. And my wife, uh, who is the CEO of Washington Hospital, saw that. And she said, you just finished your term over there with the governor, and here's an institution that looks like having some difficulties. See if you can get on the board and help them. So I did uh, inquire about it, and I got elected to be on the board. And that's how we met with Barbara and everybody. And I was on a board for about a year before we kind of got to the point where the board made a decision that, yes, we finally have to close because we can't afford to stay open as we are. And from there on, basically, then we went and looked at some alternatives, and, uh, and I suggested certain alternatives that maybe we can look at how we can financially maybe be able to afford what we're doing, a different model of, of, of how would you say, administrative way of handling it, not the care. The care is always going to be number one, and nothing changes there. But how do we, in a sense, get other people involved, payment besides just the philanthropic right. avenue? And so then I took the responsibility to take it on to manage the place, actually, as opposed to just being on a board. So I'm currently on the board as well as CEO. What did you think about when, when this uh, experienced administrator came in and said, um, you need, you need my help, I'm, I'm interested in volunteering. Well, of course, there was a little bit of trepidation on our part because we're a very small um, team, as it were, that works at George Mark, and we work in what's called an interdisciplinary fashion so that there is no hierarchy. Essentially, when we meet as a clinical team, everyone gives their input. There's no one person vetoing someone else. You know, in the hospital, it tends to be a very hierarchical setting. You've got the physician here and the nurse here and the family here and social worker over here somewhere and the doctor says do this and you do that, right? And here you have somebody coming out of the state, yes. one of the largest uh, such uh, mm -hmm. co correction and rehabilitation uh, in uh, systems in the country and one that has been very troubled. Uh, a totally different environment, government environment. Huge. But I, I didn't know that about Peter. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> all I knew was, <laughs> all I knew was that Peter was on our board, that he had a wealth of experience and knowledge that certainly nobody else in the organization had, and that he was stepping up and saying, "I think we can make this work." So I said, "Fantastic!" I said to myself, "As long as you don't mess with our clinical team." 
come on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, that's exactly what's happened. Peter's been fabulous to work with. He has absolutely guided us to sustainability and has not interfered at all with the clinical team's ability to care for the children and their families. So it's been a wonderful marriage, as it were. Absolutely. What did you find when you were there, um, both good and, and th things that perhaps were not working so well? Well, I think that, first of all, uh, once we got to the point where we looked at our budget and about 85% of our budget came from philanthropy. And as you know, the economy didn't do too well in the last number of years, and it suffered from that. So donations did not come true. So all of a sudden you find yourself basically, just like any organization, can't pay your bills. So what the decision made, it was very good from the board to do that, because a lot of boards don't want to make that decision and say, okay, we are going to close, and we are going to re-examine how we do business and how do we provide care and how we do all those things, and where are we going to get the future the money from? And so, because of licensing reasons, we basically put our license into suspension for six months. And that's basically the time period that state sort of allows you to be able to come back within that period of time, and still everything is being the same, as opposed to have to reapply and redo things right. in license. So, six months was our time period. So we sat down with the board and said, okay, what can we do to able to get some additional funds in here. And what we came up with is that part of our work that we do is transitional care, but we haven't focused much on that, which means is that the patient gets discharged from a hospital probably a little bit earlier than normally would because we can finish the care that's provided in the hospital at our site. And then we train the parents how to take care of the child and they go home. So there's an extra step in there. But what it does is allows us to take care of a child at an earlier stage, and chances are there are some insurance covering that, although it's not guaranteed. But to the extent there's insurance, we want to then now convince the insurance companies that it's their benefit, both from a quality care standpoint as well as from financially, to allow us to take care of that child in our setting. And the, the beds or, or the places are less expensive yes. in your setting, that's, significantly less expensive. So that, is that the cost benef right. benefit? That's one that you're way. Talking we're about 50% less than the cost in acute care. So insurance companies certainly like that idea. And right. w not only are we perhaps completing a course of therapy, so we're shortening the hospital stay, mm -hmm. we're also teaching that family and letting them practice taking care of their child in a home-like setting. So they can assume a lot of the care of the child with our team standing directly beside or behind them. And they're able to learn not only the care of their child, but how to troubleshoot. So you know, if they're using a machine and something isn't going right, we teach them the steps as to how to troubleshoot that. Or if the child develops a worsening of a symptom, how do you adjust that child's medications to bring that symptom back under control? So we, we can prevent unnecessary return to the hospital, emergency room visits, you know, the way um, many of families are told at night or on the weekend is you call whoever's on call because physicians aren't going to take call 24-7, obviously. And so the, the family's instructed to call a physician who may not really know their child very well. You can't, as a physician, you can't sign out all of your patients to someone else just for a and night or a weekend. the physician has to guess. Exactly. So mm -hmm. that physician as often as not, will try to troubleshoot it over the phone, and if they can't really come to a good conclusion, will say, go to the emergency room. Right. And that's something that really, generally does not benefit these children and their families. It increases costs, it's disruptive. Right. It's, it's a whole new readmission, it's a whole new process again. And the insurance companies are... are very, very expensive, absolutely. Very exactly, that's right. exactly. The other part of it is that in a hospital, when you discharge somebody, you're given as part of education and train them whatever you can, but you don't have much time. The nurses are very busy, they got other patients to take care of, so maybe you get half an hour, maybe you get an hour, but you can't observe the patient family how they take care of that patient, where we can. And that's one of the big advantages because we can actually see, not alone teach them how to use the equipment or how to take care of the patient, but also we can observe them, see how well they do. So we can make corrections, we can amplify certain things, or we can support certain things, or just the opposite, saying, look, you're not doing it right. I mean, it's big importance because that will be a readmission later to the hospital if it doesn't go well. What you're basically doing is you're taking a big chunk of cost 
out of the system, which makes the insurance companies really happy. You're making the parents happy because you are giving them a, a sense of control, and you are making the children happy by, uh, by allowing them to live in their environment. And the hospitals are happy because overcrowding is, is a constant uh, issue. So is there anybody who's unhappy with this, uh, with this whole process? Overall, I think everybody's happy with it. The problem is the insurance companies are so large and it's so bureaucratic. It's very difficult, even with the evidence we have, and we have done a study with uh, UCSF showing the cost is reduced, everything else, and they see it from their bills, still have a hard time convincing them to sign a contract with us. Because we're so unique organization, there's only one in basically in California, and there's only two in the United States, so they don't know what to do with us. We're not a skilled nursing facility, we're not a hospital, we're not a, we're not a hospice. hospice. So they say, what are you? Well, we're a cliff. And well, that's our designation as a license, but nobody knows what that is. So a very difficult time to administer, you think of a large insurance company, everything's on forms, everything on systems. System doesn't recognize you. So even if you have a contract, can't pay you because in our system, nothing says we can check off a box, this is what you are, and you get paid. You've started to conduct some studies to show the, the cost differential. Uh, could you describe what you're doing in that, I, 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 in that line and, and how um, you might be able to convince these insurance companies? Are you meeting with them privately or? We usually try it with the medical director. A medical okay. director at the insurance companies are the ones who really make the decision on these cases of this magnitude as to what happens with them. And usually Barbara does a great job of talking to the medical directors and convincing them from the medical care we provide that it's appropriate medical care. And that it's so effective it's medical It's effective care. medical care because you have evidence showing that in history behind it. And they were convincing the medical director saying it's cost effective for you to do so. So that medical director usually then agrees to it and tells somebody in the organization, say, well, okay, let's have a letter of agreement with them. Once you have a letter of agreement with the insurance company, then we go back to the contracting arm and say, hey, look, why don't we have a contract with you? So you have to go through this all the time. So that's what we're doing. So we have now about eight insurance companies, including Kaiser, who has agreed with us and given us a contract. So if we have somebody coming now into our institution who is covered by insurance, and by the way, it's not that many people still as a percentage. Right. Um, when you look at Children's Hospital, which is one of the major referral centers we have to us, 73% of their patients are Medi-Cal. And Medi-Cal pays you 10 cents on a dollar at the most. And you provide your services regardless as to regardless, patient's that's correct. ability to pay. And the other one is that we just obtained Medi-Cal approval. Up to now, for seven years, we could not get Medi-Cal, mm -hmm. although we get most of our patients are indigent coming to our institution to cover costs, even at 10 cents a dollar. Uh, Senator Corbett helped us sponsor a bill uh, that was gonna help us with that, and then the state finally decided that they rather not have the bill be passed. They just read work with us and figured it out how we can get paid. So we just got finally our first approval for Medi-Cal. That's wonderful. And there's a whole aspect of our care that we provide that's really important for which we really don't get much reimbursement, if any, um, and that's called respite care. So if you look at the experience of these families caring for this very, very sick child, many of these families literally have a mini ICU in their home. Some of these children are on 15, 20, 25 medications a day that have to be given on a very strict time schedule. Many of them have multiple breathing treatments every day. These families' lives are really consumed with simply providing enough support to keep these children alive. Without that support, many of these children would not live as long as they do. So we provide a place where this family can either come and stay with their child and let us do a lot of that care while they have a chance to just relax, or they can actually leave their child once they trust us, which all of them, or most of eventually. them, eventually come to trust us, they actually will actually leave their child and then go off and have a family vacation. Um, we've had couples who literally were in tears. I remember one couple in particular who brought their child for the first time for respite, and I think their child was about 15 years old, and they said, we haven't been away together for a weekend in 15 years. We, we, we could never do that because we had no one that we could trust to take care of our child the way we do. And they came and they stayed with us one weekend. We proved to them that we could do that. And then they took off and had a wonderful weekend away and came back looking like different people. I mean, it was incredible to see the difference in them, in their whole demeanor and, you know, et cetera. So 
the respite care is critically, critically, critically important. I mean, that's what keeps these families sound. And yet it's the part of our care that has the least reimbursement. And in many ways, it's almost the most important because it's preventative care, as it were. It would be great to have this type of a model deployed in other communities throughout the United States. Uh, let's, let, let's try and shine a bit of a light on, on how you operate and, and the type of competencies that you've recruited into the organization and, and, and how you care. Okay, so our, our interdisciplinary team is, is the um, central part of our, of our care philosophy. Um, and that interdisciplinary team inc includes a physician, which is generally me unless I'm away, and then there's another physician covering. There is um, a whole group of nurses, and all of our nurses are pediatric trained. Um, some of them have had um, more inpatient hospital experience than others. Um, they work very, th many of them have had um, intensive care experience. So some of them come from a nursery, a neonatal intensive care unit background, or a pediatric intensive care unit background. Others of them have been um, working on, in a children's hospital in a rehabilitation unit, but they all have extensive background in, in pediatric and in dealing with not only very ill children, but also chronically ill children. Um, so that the level of care that we're able to provide is um, many times higher than a regular unit on, in a children's hospital, but not as high as the pediatric intensive care unit or as the neonatal intensive care unit. And how many nurses do you have? About maybe 40 to 45 nurses, there. depending, upon, yeah, depending mm -hmm. upon the circumstances. But one of the things that we're doing is that administratively, we staff nursing based on acuity and then we want just like the acute care hospitals do, right. which wasn't the case before. So in terms of the volume of the patients. So we are basically ratcheted up from a standard model to accommodate that necessity. And that's by shift. We have three shifts. So what we're looking at basically reducing our cost by being volume and intensity related. But on the other hand, we provide the care that was necessary. And on the administrative side, we, I'm the only administrator there is. There isn't any other hierarchy other than that. And then we have uh, subbed out some of the, like the accounting, purchasing, human resources to a hospice by the bay, another organization, for them it's incremental costs. So incremental cost basis, they're charging us probably 20% of what our costs were previously in a full-time positions. And now you're repositioned for your future. What does that future look like? We would like to get uh, a study done, which we have, it looks like, an approval to go ahead with, with the Haas School of Business of Berkeley. To do a definitive study with insurance companies' participation in showing the cost savings, because I think this economy, as you know, is moving, government is moving. They have Obama, and everybody is saying, "Look, these costs needs to be controlled somewhere," and this is the place where costs can be controlled without compromising care. So we'd like to definitively do the study with their assistance. So there will be some third-party involvement, so it doesn't look like it's us trying to sell by something, and the insurance companies could be involved with that one. So hopefully that will set the scene for people saying it makes a lot of sense. But secondarily, we'd like to get closer to our referring sources. We already have a transfer agreement with UC uh, SF. Mm -hmm. We'd like to get that with Children's Hospital in Stanford so we can easier provide a continuum of care. We like to be involved with them to the point where they say, if there's an alternative to be discussed, the physicians do discuss that and say there's an alternative for you. So the parents could, in a sense, already pre-select to look at some place to go if it is appropriate to do so. So we like to be part of their continuum so parents don't see this. I have to transfer someplace else where I'm losing some of the benefits I'm getting here. They're seeing this is part of their care. So it's expansion based on the idea of cost-efficient delivery of value to families. Palliative care is still something that's not discussed a lot or really on the, in the front of most uh, physicians' minds. And I think we need to really continue our efforts to um, support physicians in 
having those discussions with families in knowing when is the appropriate time to bring up the subject of, of palliative care. If you go out and interview people in the healthcare system, many of them will say, you've got palliative care and then you've got curative care. And that's absolutely not true. Palliative care and curative care, well, they, they go simultaneously. You can pursue curative care quite effectively while still saying, what is the quality of life here? Let's include, let's factor in quality of life when we're making these decisions. It's not an all or none. It's an and, and. Palliative care is simply a part of this child's medical care. It's not either or. Well, Peter, Barbara, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Thank you for sharing this wonderful model with us, and thank you for your insights. Well, thank, thank you for you. having Appreciate us it. very Thanks much. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Thank you.